Who here likes music? Okay, everyone. Cool. Sweet. Uh, who here likes musical history? Oh, uh, no. Music! We all love it. We all listen to it. We all carry it around in our pockets. Wow. There are many moments that have occurred throughout musical history which can be looked upon as turning points, but no decade can be seen as more of a turning point than the 60s. You can think of the 60s as the time when kids finally cracked and started refusing to eat their greens. Except in this case, greens is a substitute for Western Christian family values and also shitty music. But hey, if we're going to talk about the 60s, we may as well start at the beginning. Life in the USA was simple in the early 60s. Coming straight out of the decade of the American dream, the 60s began as a similarly all-American decade. Elvis was still king, everyone still wore suits, cars still looked like this, if you were a woman you weren't allowed to do anything, you know the good old days. Well, Elvis may have been the king of rock and roll, Chuck Berry was certainly its dad. Not only did he have the moves, not only did he have the grooves, but he had the revolutionary idea of using the same chord progression every song. Hey, we can do that too, said the Beach Boys, who then proceeded to steal Chuck Berry songs and change the lyrics to be about surfing. They're really rocking in Boston and Pittsburgh, PA. If anybody had a notion across the USA, all over St. Louis and down in New Orleans, you'd see them wearing their baggies, where Archie Samuels do. I know they also wrote their own songs, don't get mad at me. The point still stands that everyone was ripping each other off and rock music was becoming very formulaic. An example of this is the ice cream progression, which dominated music in the 50s and early 60s. Was music doomed to sound the same forever? Not. So. Fast. Said the luxurious Bob Dylan, a man spreading the entire folk rock genre with his simple acoustic guitar riffs and complex mind bamboozling lyrics. What set Dylan apart from other American artists from the time is that he wrote songs about change. Well, the times they are changing. And uh, as a plus, he didn't use the same chord progression every time. This was the man who made folk cool again, after all. Bob Dylan was certainly right about one thing the times were indeed. A change in. People started to ask, wait, is racism a bad thing? Also, the president took an unfortunate car ride. Also, the Vietnam- But hey, before we talk about the US anymore, we gotta divert our attention to the UK and the rest of Europe too, I guess. Europe was divided, and on the western side of the Iron Curtain, culturally, society began changing. If the 50s was Europe's decade of rebuilding, then the 60s was its decade of rebirth. Legislations were changing, the economies were recovering, and Europe began to find a sense of shared identity. Or as this guy, British Prime Minister Harold Macmillan, described it, the winds of change were blowing over Europe, and one of the first major gusts can be pinpointed to the rise of these four gentlemen. John, Paul, George, Ringo, the Fab Four, the Beatles, whatever the fuck you want to call them. You might have heard of them. They started off in Liverpool, but relocated to Hamburg in 1960 in pursuit of a record deal. Here's an image of them getting high in Hamburg to prove it. But wait, who's that on the left? That's not Ringo. Who, who is? Who? Well, in the early days of the Fab Four, Ringo was nowhere to be found as the occupation of drummer was filled by Pete Best. Until they kicked him out. They even ripped his face out of all photos on the cover of Anthology 1. Yikes. <laughs> 
After spending the better part of the early 60s playing shows in musty German dungeons, the Beatles decided it was time to sign a record deal. So they met with a producer in London. And got rejected. Then they tried again. And got rejected again. Eventually, on a rainy day, after yet another rejection, the Beatles could all be found sobbing on the side of a road. They were moments from giving up and flying back to Liverpool when a mysterious trench-cloaked figure appeared out of the fog and introduced himself as a producer, offering the four of them an audition of sorts. The man was George Martin. Let me just clarify, that's not actually how the Beatles met George Martin, but like... It's probably cooler than how they actually met him, so I'm just going to say it was. Anyways, the four of them played a few songs for Martin, and he was thoroughly unimpressed. But he later said he had nothing to lose. So he signed them on anyways, why not, why not, honestly. With the producer under their proverbial belts, the Beatles released their first single, Love Me Do, in late 1962. It did okay, going as far as to reach number 17 on the UK charts. Not too shabby for a debut single. But they craved more. So John developed one of his old pieces, Please Please Me, which originally had been a slow ballad inspired by the works of Roy Orbison, and had also originally been despised by Martin. But with some tweaking, the song was completely reworked. Upon its release, Please Please Me hit number one on the charts. The Beatles had officially reached their event horizon of fame, and from there, it only got bigger. They later released a similarly titled album called Please Please Me, which hit number one on the album charts and stayed there for 30 weeks until being replaced with their second album with the Beatles. Both albums later went platinum. For me to you, she loves you, I want to hold your hand, and can't buy me love, all hit number one and stayed on the charts for obscenely long periods of time. So yeah, they were they were um, doing pretty well for themselves. The Beatles, as big as they were becoming, weren't the only band brewing up trouble in Britain. Over in London, Brian Jones, an aspiring guitarist, had recently placed an ad in the local newspaper for an entitled project which he was cobbling together. The ad caught the attention of many talented musicians around London, most notably Keith Richards and Mick Jagger. Eventually, Jagger and Richards joined Jones' little ensemble, which at the time comprised of Jones himself and keyboardist Ian Stewart. There was only one problem, however. They didn't have a name. That is until, during a phone call, Jones noticed a Muddy Waters LP lying on the floor by him. One of the song names caught his eye. Rolling Stone. From that point on, the band would be known as the Rolling Stones. That was a cool intro. Cut one year and many unstable lineups later, and an official formation of the band had finally come to fruition. Seeing Brian Jones on rhythm guitar, Mick Jagger on vocals, Keith Richards on lead guitar, Bill Wyman on bass, Charlie Watts on drums, and Ian Stewart on keyboard. <laughs> and then they kicked Ian Stewart out for not being hot enough. That's, that's not even a joke, by the way. By 1964, they'd released their first album accurately titled the Rolling Stones, and hit number one with their single, It's All Over Now. And then they released another album. Then another. Then another. Then another. Then another. All within the span of slightly over a year. I'm getting ahead of myself. Before we talk about the Stones any further, it's important that you understand that these boys weren't wholesome like the Beatles. They were edgy, blues-loving, devil-worshipping, baby-eating communists. The fact that the Stones were more gritty-sounding than their clean-cut counterparts meant that they had a wide appeal with young adults and teenage boys, and their producers knew this. Other hard rock bands started popping up around this time. In 1964, the Kinks released their first album, and the following year, the Who hit the scene with their debut album, My Generation. Musically, the times were turning in Britain and it was only a matter of time until the tides arrived at the shores of North America, or in other words, the British invasion had begun. The music scene had shifted dramatically in the United States. All the famous people were British now, chord progressions were minor, guitar sounded more distorted, 
and it wasn't safe to walk without a bodyguard if you happened to be a famous musician. By this point, the British invasion wasn't only dominating the United States, but the rest of the world by extension. The Beatles were touring everywhere from Sweden to Canada to the Philippines. This inspired a shift in music worldwide. You can hear influence anywhere from Madrid to Hong Kong. With the success of the British invasion and artists like Bob Dylan, other folk rock artists began to gain traction, such as Simon Garfunkel. Paul Simon will forever be remembered for his hauntingly beautiful songwriting and mystifying lyrics, and as a guy who really likes Africa. Art Garfunkel will be remembered for his buttery orgasm-inducing voice and his last name, which is a verb now, I guess. Are you trying to Garfunkel me? Maybe. The two had actually released their debut album, Wednesday Morning 3AM, a year prior. It was an experimental folk album through and through. It managed to sell a jaw-dropping 3,000 copies worldwide. Hello darkness, my old friend. This failure was not taken super well by the group, and uh, Paul Simon eventually decided to move to London with his head bowed in a fit of shame. I know what you're all thinking. How does Bob Dylan factor into all this? Well, on March 22, 1965, Dylan released Bring It All Back Home, followed shortly by Highway 61 Revisited. Apart from the fact that both these albums feature a cover of Bob Dylan looking mopey in front of someone else, they also both incorporated elements of electric rock into Dylan's folk repertoire. Around this time, he played at the Newsport Folk Festival and was greeted with much- What is that? Is that an electric guitar? You motherfucking heretic! This shift was not taken well by Dylan's fan base, and for the following year, almost everywhere Dylan went, he was met with anger, booing, and ire, causing him to cry every night. Also, he rolled the Beatles' first joint, so that's cool, that's cool, I guess. And hey, you know what else is cool? Tom Wilson, Simon and Garfunkel's producer, who'd also worked on Like a Rolling Stone with Bob Dylan, decided to once again create a rock folk hybrid by remixing Sounds of Silence via added drums and electric guitar. Since Simon and Garfunkel didn't have a fan base who could get butthurt from the fact that they were mixing rock and folk, the song blew up, sweeping the charts. Paul Simon, who hadn't been informed of this remix, nearly lost his shit when he heard the song for the first time. Paul Simon headed back to New York to drive a stake through Wilson's heart, but upon arrival realized fame is actually pretty cool, so he decided to stick with it. Go team. Meanwhile, John Coltrane thought to himself, what if I made a spiritual jazz album that creates a real experience for listeners via smart use of dissonance and building tension followed by satisfying releases of said tension? Then he made a spiritual jazz album that creates real experiences for listeners via smart use of dissonance and building tension followed by satisfying releases of said tension. Keep this album in mind, we'll come back to it later. Drama alert! The Rolling Stones and the Beatles looked at each other slightly aggressively. Now they are arch rivals. Except that they actually weren't. But they kind, they kind of were. Despite the constant feuding for the number one spot, the members of the two bands actually kind of slightly liked each other. Almost. Kind of. But that didn't stop Mick Jagger from spreading the idea that they hated each other considering the conflict boosts sales. And everyone has a boner for picking sides anyways. Henceforth, fake beef ensued. It's possible that this helped groom phony music drama, which we know all too well. So thanks, Mick. Oh fuck, LSD just hit the streets and it's about to start changing shit. Ah!